Next uh, motion, and that is the item in the order paper on concern and anxiety over the reopening of schools. I will now ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly recognises the concern and anxiety that exists among teaching and non-teaching staff, as well as among parents and young people, in relation to the eventual reopening of schools, understands the challenges facing school boards of governors and principals in keeping children and teachers safe while providing high quality education, believes that any reopening of schools should be based on scientific and medical advice consistent with that provided by the World Health Organization and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, and calls on the Minister of Education to engage and consult extensively with education stakeholders as well as parents and young people in advance of the reopening of schools in order to provide clear and early guidance. Thank you. I call upon Karen Mullen to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and that is published on the Marshall list. Uh, please open the debate, Ms. Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And firstly, I would like to offer my deepest condolences to Noah Donoghue's mother, Fiona, his family, friends, and the school community at St. Malachy's College, Belfast, at this very difficult time. At the outset of this debate, I would like to place on record my sincere gratitude and appreciation to all of our principals and to all of our teaching and non-teaching staff. You have stepped up and delivered for our children and young people throughout the course of this unprecedented public health emergency. You have put the shoulder to the wheel whether it was providing supervised learning for our children, for the children of our key workers, or delivering remote learning, you have played your part during this difficult period. Likewise, I also want to pay tribute to parents and guardians out there who had to quickly adjust and adapt to new home learning arrangements for their children by also balancing all of their, their, all their everyday commitments. I, like many others in this chamber, are well aware of how difficult it has been at times. For our children and young people, this pandemic and the associated measures that came with it have no doubt hit them the hardest. Many will have found it difficult to access appropriate equipment for remote learning. Many will have had to endure difficult circumstances at home. And for many, the sheer isolation and boredom of not taking part in the usual school day and missing out on that crucial social interaction and relationship building will have had a profound impact on their emotional well-being and mental health. To support our children, to support families and to support our teaching and non-teaching staff, the Minister must work with them and listen to them. We cannot allow the chaos which mark, marked the period leading up to the closures to be replicated come the end of August. This requires firm leadership as well as commitment to work in the spirit of collaboration and mutual respect. No doubt there will be some level of difficulty when schools do begin to reopen, but we can minimise those difficulties if we maximise cooperation and work together. At this point, I want to acknowledge the role of our unions, who have worked extremely hard over this period, alongside the many stakeholders who not only provided support but came forward with solutions, and their role will be invaluable over the coming weeks and months. I believe it was wrong and absolutely unacceptable for teachers to hear dribs and drabs of information about the eventual reopening of schools through unofficial channel, channel, channels. Our teachers and principals deserve far better than that. Official guidance released to date has been at times slow in coming, and it has also been marred by confusion. We are now at the end of June and our teachers prepare to take a well-deserved break. In recent days, many have been in their classrooms trying to redesign layouts, figuring out how many children they can accommodate, and anxious as how, to remote, how remote learning and classroom learning will be delivered at the same time. Furthermore, school leaders and board of governors are trying to get to grips with coordinating what the new school day will look like in each of their settings. 
They are worried about health and safety. They are worried about cost implications. And they are keen to get cl clarity on all our pressing, pressing issues, such as transport. As I have alluded to, and as outlined in the motion, the widest possible engagement with stakeholders across the education sector is crucial. Understandably, one single perfect solution does not exist, but in collaborating with and collect collecting all the experience that exists across the sector, new and creative solutions will certainly present themselves. I will also re-emphasise, in accordance with the motion, the need to bring parents, guardians and young people into the process. We should be empowering them and giving them a sense of ownership so that when the time comes for a return to school, they can have every confidence in these new arrangements. I have touched on the mental health impact that COVID and school closures has had on our young people. So it's important that when reopening takes place, that the schools are equipped with the necessary resources to support and address the emotional well-being of our young people. I understand that much valuable learning time has been lost due to COVID, but in the short term, I am more concerned about ensuring we support our young people in building back up their mental health and resilience. With that in mind, I think it's appropriate to take the opportunity to once again commend the compassion and the leadership shown by many grammar schools in their decision to suspend the, the use of unregulated transfer tests this year. This is timely acknowledgement of the reality of how damaging these tests are for young people. And to those schools who have not made the decision to suspend the tests yet, I would urge you to please reconsider. If there was ever a time to place the needs and the well-being of our children above academic selection, it is now. On the issue of childcare, this could be the defining issue of the context of our recovery post-COVID. While I welcome the Minister's latest update in relation to the childcare, to childcare, there remains many unresolved issues. This will be of particular importance come the autumn with blended learning and the possibility of some children may be required to be at home during the week. Making the funding available is one thing, but the settings need to be able to apply for and access it. We don't want a repeat of the last round of funding which has seen very little of the £12 million spent and money returned, whilst the, struggle, the, sector, is, whilst the sector is struggling. We need our childcare sector resourced and ready to go in time for reopening of schools or families will face further hardship. There remains a lack of clarity from the Minister and from the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessments as to where we are at in terms of a review of curriculum and exam specifications for next year. I am concerned at the pace of these developments and no more so than our teachers who are in the position of having to plan for their way ahead without this distinct guidance from the relevant body. The Minister should also remain aware of the fact that we are an island and it would be helpful if regular engagement would take place with the Minister of Education in the South in relation to all of these matters. In concluding, Mr uh, Temporary Speaker, while much work has been done in relation to all of these issues through the Education Restart Programme, it is quite evident that there remains much work left, left to do. I am calling on you, Minister, to enhance the approach, collaborate widely across the sector in a meaningful way and give the reassurance and the clarity to the concerns and anxieties of all those who will be at the focal point of reopening our schools. And finally, I ask members to support our motion and the SDLP amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mullen. Uh, Ms. Mullen, in her speech, mentioned the fact that we're at the end of June. It would be helpful if the debate didn't conclude at the start of July. <laughs> there are 12 speakers down for this particular debate, which is a an unusual level of interest for a debate held at uh, such a late hour, so I will have to try and keep matters under control to ensure that we stick to time. I am now going to call upon Daniel McCroston to move the amendment. Mr McCroston. Uh, thank you, Mr Temporary uh, Speaker. Uh, I know that uh, it, it is unusual for so many of us looking to speak at this time of night, and I have a two-hour drive beyond the end of this debate. 
but can I say that it's good to see you in your temporary post up there. It's almost like the, the naughty boy in the corners we put to the front of the classroom for being bold, so it'll keep you, it'll keep you, it'll keep you well behaved. Um, Mr. Temporary Speaker, as SDLP spokesperson for education and as MLA for West Tyrone, I welcome this opportunity to move today's amendment on what is an extremely important, emotive and difficult issue facing many principals, teachers and parents across the North. I do want to start, by, uh, start my contribution this evening in acknowledging the vital role teachers have, have played and continue to play over the COVID-19 pandemic, where they have been active in ensuring as many children as possible have access to distance learning and they have been planning rigorously for a return to the schoolroom and teaching, uh, on, uh, and teaching our children. I want to make it abundantly clear and put on record that our teaching workforce are very hard workers. They have not been on holiday. They have spent the last number of months preparing and ensuring that children are continuing to be educated with the resources available to them. They commit every single fibre of their being to improve the educational outcomes of every child across the North. I fully and wholeheartedly condemn any elected representative or member of the public, for that matter, that brings the teaching profession into disrepute or criticises the huge efforts and contribution that they make to our society and the education of our children. Those comments have been very unhelpful, upsetting and inappropriate, and that has been shared with me uh, by many, many uh, teachers. Mr Temporary Speaker, during uh, to today's motion, Although I agree with the contents of the motion as proposed, I do believe it is missing a key component, and that key component is ensuring that all pupils return to school on an equal footing following the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the last number of months, it has become clear that many pupils faced limitations in accessing online courses and in receiving tutoring. In this regard, it is important for this chamber to recognise that poverty prevents many children accessing online teaching and that many parents simply cannot afford private tutoring. A report published in June of this year by Dr Noel Purdy from Stranmillis sheds much needed light on this issue, where it states that only half of the children in the North have access to devices capable of accessing online courses for schoolwork. It shows that 25 per cent of parents do not have access to their own printer at home, and the report states that there are significant connectivity issues caused by poor broadband provision in many parts of Northern Ireland. These issues collectively have prevented many children from progressing their education over, over time, and the SDLP believe that it is incumbent on this chamber to do something about that. Despite the Minister's rollout of electronic devices, which was very welcome, Minister, the fact that this was done in late June has meant that catch-up uh, has simply not been possible. M Mr D Temporary Speaker, it is vitally important that we today acknowledge that poverty has had a major impact on the education of our children, and this impact has been exacerbated in the past four months. The Institute of Fiscal Studies published a report in May stating that children from more affluent families are spending 30 per cent more time on home learning each week compared to children from more deprived backgrounds. A shocking figure. The Education Endowment Fund has also published a report in June this year that adds weight to the claim where it stated that the impact of school closures on attainment will widen the attainment gap between disadvantaged children and their peers by an average of 36 per cent. Again, another worrying figure. This margin is absolutely shocking, and it is one that we cannot allow to continue. While it is clear that all children have lost out over lockdown, it is especially the case for those from socially deprived backgrounds. And the SDLP believe that a catch-up programme paid for by the Department of Education is absolutely essential to ensure that no child is left behind. I would therefore urge members to support the SDLP amendment as proposed. It is important that we do everything we can to support all children in education, but I believe that those most disadvantaged must be looked after. And in that regard, it is reprehensible that the two governing parties in this executive continue to fall out over the simplest of things, therefore our children losing out as a consequence of that. Mr. The executive is still functioning. I will. I'm glad to get the, the point to clarify. I, I trust he was referring to Northern Ireland when he keeps talking about the North and he's not talking about some other jurisdiction. That's the first point. The second point is, is there not a five-party mandatory coalition? Or maybe have I missed something uh, in the last number of months? 
Because is this not a classic case of when it suits the SDLP, have a go, but when there's credit to be had, oh, then we'll take the credit even for things that they never even uh, supported in the first place? Well, I'm glad that it'll have such a, an invaluable impact on the education of our children and the concerns I'm sharing here. But I will say that whilst we're talking about the executive, if each and every department is funded fairly, and I include the SDLP absolutely in that, instead of the carve-up between the big two, I'll be a happier man. Thank you for your intervention. Mr Temporary Speaker, I want to now turn to the Minister's plans published last week on the reopening of schools. The SDLP is engaged with principals and teachers from across the north of Ireland where considerable concerns have been raised. They believe that guidance has not been sufficient and, they, uh, and that it has not been given enough time to properly implement the Minister's plan before the end of August. And this is something that has been shared with all of the members across this House. One of the main concerns surrounds the Minister's plans for a one metre social distancing rule in schools and plans to create bubbles where that is not possible. And at the same time, teachers are expected to maintain a two metre distance. That does, it, won't, it doesn't make sense, particularly with younger children who may be distressed and may need comfort or whatever and will need the attention of the teacher. So the two metre rule is going to be very, very difficult. School principals have rightly called out this measure as unworkable and believe that classrooms can only accommodate 50% of the class or less under the guidance. This is especially the case for many rural schools who are traditionally smaller and many are already oversubscribed. Indeed, the Minister's guidance also encourages schools to make use of all available space. Principals haven't even been told what measures can be introduced to increase class sizes or teaching space. And this brings me to a fundamental point. I will, Minister. Yeah. Thank the member for giving way. I suppose maybe to uh, follow on from a point that uh, Mr. Story, this is the same guidance that was passed at the executive unanimously, including by the SDLP, and all the details, particularly as regards to social distancing, again was approved of and supported by the SDLP minister. So th there does seem to be a little bit of double standards here. Thank you, Minister, for accepting my concerns in relation to children. And also, Minister, I wouldn't want to comment on the antics of this executive because, believe me, you wouldn't like what I have to say. Uh, these are all questions that have so far not been answered. There are all, these are all massive issues if this plan is to work and is to be successfully implemented in nine short weeks' time. The concern I have, Minister, Mr. Temporary Speaker, is that teachers again and principals will be thrown into the deep end, expected to burden the huge amount of stress to solve the many problems that they have been asking for clarification around since lockdown began. That is not fair that our teachers and principals continue to burden such stress. I believe it is imperative that there are additional cleaning staff in schools, Minister, and I have addressed this with you, and I appreciate that you have recognised that there are issues that need to be addressed there. Other countries have reopened their schools successfully and are, and are employing cleaners on a full-time basis to ensure the health and safety of staff. If social bubbles are actually to work without rigid infection controls, it will be very difficult to ensure there is no cross-contamination, especially if areas such as toilets are not regularly cleaned. Schools need more guidance and reassurance on this issue, and this should not come at added expense to an already stretched or overstretched budgets. Principals are saying, we want guidance that is clear. Guidance has now been provided, although I don't agree with the method of which it was provided, through the BBC largely, but whenever they have received this guidance, their big question is how do we implement this guidance? How do we ensure the safety of staff and pupils if we aren't being allocated an extra pound or penny to ensure the safety of staff and pupils? For the public to have confidence in the safe reopening of schools and to ensure their children are safe, to ensure that staff are comfortable returning to schools, we need to ensure that they are safe and that they have the money to put in place the necessary resources that is required uh, for that aim. School transport, Minister, is going to be a huge issue. We can talk about the start and the end of the school day, but it starts when the child leaves the house in the morning to the return. And we need to ensure that if we talk about social bubbles and we talk about social distancing in schools, that things are put in place to ensure, whilst in school transport, children are kept at a sufficient distance that ensures their safety. And, Minister, I'll finish on this. PPE has caused some confusion. You're on record saying continually that there is no real requirement for it to ensure the safety of staff and pupils. Why is it that other uh, science and medical advice has suggested that it is absolutely essential in confined spaces, be it public transport or other areas? And Minister, will you accept that it's, it's a vital... Go ahead, Minister. In relation to it, I have never said... Minister Weir, Minister yeah, Weir. Is it, is it correct for the member to misrepresent any views? I have never said 
the PP is not needed in any set of circumstances. I've indicated the limitations of where it's needed, and the guidance directly gives the circumstances in which it is needed. So I've never uh, indicated what the members order. suggested I've, I've said. That's not a point of order, and it is also, Mr McCrossan, your time is up. Could I thank you for your kind words? The only criteria for the post of temporary speaker is extreme old age and the possession of a pulse, nothing else. Uh, no, no, no talent whatsoever is required. Uh, now, talking of talent, we now call upon the honourable member, Mr William Humphrey. Uh, temp temporary Speaker, and I uh, congratulate you on your uh, elevation. Um, can I declare an interest as a governor in two schools? Uh, with regard to the motion in front of us and the amendment today, we are minded to support the motion and the amendment, despite what we have just heard, because of the underscore what the minister has been doing and these motions call him to do. In addressing the issues around schools and returning safely and protecting pupils and staff are key to rebooting our economy, as is the issue, a very vital issue, of childcare. And I too would pay tribute to our school principals, teachers, auxiliary staff, governors, uh, for all that they have done to ensure that our young people stay safe during this COVID pandemic. Indeed, if you look at the motion that talks about keeping children and teachers safe, believes that reopening of schools should be based on scientific and medical advice, consistent with that provided by the WHO and the European Centre for Disease and Prevention and Control. It calls on the Education Minister to engage and consult in advance of reopening of schools in order to provide clear and early guidance. Consistency of message around COVID and the pandemic are absolutely crucial. Other members have said that. So today's funeral then, for Sinn Féin members breached COVID-19 regulations, ignored advice from the Health Minister, the Chief Medical Officer, scientists, the Public Health Authority, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister flies in the face of all of that. Indeed, the same Deputy First Minister said in answer to a question at the press conference at the Long Gallery yesterday, when asked a question by the BBC about social distancing and today's funeral, Everyone who is attending the funeral should observe public health advice. So today's events, what a message to the thousands of people who have responsibly stayed at home to shield because of their health. What, what, a, what, what a message to those people who have been practising social distancing. And what a message to those National Health Service workers and key workers over the last number of months. Indeed, I think my view is that the advice has undermined the executive's message. Order, order. I'm sure the honourable member will be going back to the, the core issues. Okay. Indeed, I understand, in my view, today's behaviour undermined the Northern Ireland executive's message and policy, undermined the health minister, undermined the chief medical officer, undermined scientific advice, and undermined the public health authority advice. Not only undermined it, but frankly ignored it. Given away, like surely it, we would be in the most bizarre situation if, as a result of this evening's proceedings in this House, this motion was to be passed, as it most likely will be. And then teachers decided, uh, when schools reopened, just to ignore all the guidance. What message would that send to parents? Yet today we had the Deputy First Minister and ministers and members of this House fragrantly breaching those regulations in a way that set the example which is disgraceful. Not only undermine the guidance that has been given for months, they totally ignored it. Indeed, I believe Sinn Féin have undermined their own position and credibility on this issue. And the question, therefore, is uh, how these members uh, have, have behaved and is it a breach of the ministerial code? No, a very given way. The Education Committee members will know that this Minister has made himself very accessible and has been very responsive to both the Committee and to this House. They have said it here in this House and in Committee. I understand that the Minister has engaged in face-to-face -face and on Zoom with some 750 principals during COVID. The Minister has held two pub public press conferences, the first exec Executive Minister to do so. The Department of Education, under this Minister, and his leadership was the first department to co-design a government policy document with stakeholders, i.e. principals, in the new school day document. 
Minister Weir has sought to work const constructively with trade unions and sought their opinions. Mr. Temporary Speaker, Northern Ireland provided restart documentation well in advance of the other United Kingdom regions. Indeed, if I, may, if I might just be given some time, in relation to public health position in the Republic of Ireland, it states very clearly the position of the Republic of Ireland, public health guidelines to govern the reopening of schools in late August and September will not be published for some time, according to the comments made by the Minister for Education in the Irish Parliament. Schools had been hoping for guidelines on social distancing and other public health matters to be sent out before primary schools closed at the end of this month. This month. However, the Minister for Education said this afternoon, 24th of June, the reopening of schools was nine or ten weeks away. And this was time to continue to consult public health experts to develop and plan appropriate guidance. The source is RTE. So, so, so very clearly, the Minister has been giving the leadership, not just in the United Kingdom, but also across uh, these islands, including the Irish Republic. So, as, I, as I've said, Mr Temporary Speaker, in congratulating you on your elevation to your new temporary position, I wish you well. And we, at this stage of the debate, will be supporting both the, the, the motion and the amendment, depending on how the debate goes and proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Humphrey. I now call upon Mr. Robbie Butler. Mr. Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker. And I'm actually um, a bit too late in the mood a little bit. I'm just glad to not be following Daniel McCrossan for a change. I follow him in the Education Committee, and I was psyching myself up. I was thinking I'm going to have to get this done in alphabetical order instead of following this guy when we're talking about education. But uh, the, uh, on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party and on behalf of myself, I do welcome the, the motion and amendment and their intent. And as has been picked out, there are perhaps some imperfections in them, but in the round we will be supporting them. I think it's really important that when we're, we're talking about the return to school of our pupils and the, the, the safety of the staff and all of those connected uh, with schools, that we are careful that we don't catastrophize, catastroph, catastrophize every conversation that we have. Um, and, and I'll pick that out as... as sure that's a proper word. <laughs> catastrophize. Oh, I don't, I'll have to eat more soaring loaf and drink more tea. <laughs> okay, so the, the motion is good. The intent is good because it's talking about uh, looking at the concerns and the anxiety of all the stakeholders across, uh, across the piece here, and there are many. And what I think has happened in the debate over this past number of weeks is teachers have been used and they've been abused. And they've been used and abused from different quarters. I noticed that in the, in the print media, for instance, there seemed to be some people who were itching for a fight. They were itching to get the, the teachers into a corner and pitch them against parents. And, and, and actually, there were, there were a number of um, uh, petitions doing the rounds from other professions, uh, which worried me greatly, actually. And, and these professions seem to be pitting themselves against teachers and calling for this mass, act, uh, mass impetus of children into schools in September. And I understand why some people might want to see that. But let's be clear. We have never dealt with anything like COVID in our puff. Never once. There's no rule book for this. I mean, we, we are doing our best, and I believe everybody is doing their best. I believe everybody in here, in this chamber, and each party is doing their best. And the, 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 what we need to do is give that leadership. Give the leadership where it's needed. Even after today, we need to give that leadership. That's, that's what we need to do. I don't want to see teachers getting caught in the crossfire here. And Mr. McCrossan expressed it really well. The teachers have stepped up to the mark. The minister has, to his credit, made himself available at every opportunity to engage with teachers, whether that's through their unions or directly. The committee, through the, the, the chair, uh, have, have, have done that at every occasion. We have met with different teachers' unions. I've sat on different Zoom meetings, as the minister has, with the Ulster Teachers' Union. Um, and, 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 and other unions. And, and there's no doubt that the intent is uh, to have our children return as safely as possible. But the protection of everybody involved is crucial. And I actually don't think that the Minister has been found wanting in, in collaboration, to be fair. We may disagree on certain points uh, of the, the guidance, and I certainly do. Um, uh, Mr Graham Galtier probably want to kick me in the shins for mentioning his name. He's, he's uh, NIHT, and uh, he, he had a tweet on Friday night. It was 140 characters, and I reckon in his 140 character tweet, he summarised what the guidance should be. I don't think it needs to be a huge document. It's the reality of where we're going to be at the end of August and the start of September, if COVID has been dealt with. 
then we return. If social distancing is not an issue, we return. Sorry? What's the tweet? <laughs> I'll print it out tomorrow. Put my name to it. You'll probably claim it to you, well, Daniel, uh, if it's good. But the reality of what we need to be talking about tonight is the priorities. And there are serious priorities, uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I just want to raise a, a couple of them. Transport is a big issue, a serious issue, if we are still facing the pandemic and epidemic uh, of COVID. And even more so than that, with our special education needs children and the complexities of their medical care and those vulnerable children, we, we, we've, we've got all these new terminologies like key workers and, and so on, and we're all getting used to them. But the reality is for a lot of these children, they're already facing challenging, challenging times in their education. And they're... Oh, absolutely, yes, indeed. Thank the member uh, for giving way briefly. Would he recognise the constructive meeting that the Education Committee had with the National Deaf Children's Society in particular, and, and recognise that that is a, a particular cohort of children that we need to be conscious of in our response to COVID-19? I will absolutely, absolutely, and I thank the Chair for, for bringing that to my attention because it was another uh, community within the education sector which is uh, disadvantaged at times, and we, we, we chatted with them, I think it was Monday, uh, Chair, and they brought a number of things to the fore, and I'm sure that the, the Minister, if he hasn't already spoken to them, that he will. Uh, and I think that's where our priorities need to be. I um, just want to want, uh, address one thing there, and again it was Mr McCross who brought it up, and the, the, the correlation of poverty, educational outcome. But something new happened this time too with COVID. It wasn't just the children who find themselves socially disadvantaged. It were the, the children belonged to parents of key and frontline workers. And those children weren't able to avail of the, 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 the learning and the support during these past three or four months, which gives me, leads me on to my, my, my main point. And I have a serious uh, worry and a serious concern about what blended learning is going to be and what we expect it to, to, to the outcome of blended learning to be. Uh, because I'm not sure how we mark that. Um, it's already been pointed out about the discrepancy between those who have and those who haven't. But even if we did give it to them all, the safest and best place for any child to learn and the most equitable place for a child to learn is in the classroom. And I think we need to do everything we can collectively to see every child back at school but safely and give the guidance as best we can to those teachers and those stakeholders that we are speaking on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Butler. Uh, this speaker is Mr Little. Uh, it would be unusual for the chair of the relevant committee to speak early in the, motion, in the debate, uh, though Mr Little has indicated that he's not speaking as chair, he's speaking as an individual MLA. Mr Little. Thank you, Temporary Speaker. Well, I welcome the opportunity uh, to consider how we work together with our outstanding teaching and non-teaching staff, parents and guardians, and pupils to rise to the challenges facing education. The first task is to move beyond the unacceptable narrative that some people within the education sector are attempting to avoid doing their job. Our teaching and non-teaching staff need us to back them, not attack them. We also need to move beyond a situation where the Education Minister uh, tells me via the media that my job is to not be convinced by anything that is said to me. I make no apologies for finding the school leaders, teachers, parents and pupils with whom I engage to be convincing on a wide range of issues, and I can respectfully give way to the Education Minister if he wishes to specify by whom he thinks I ought not to be convinced. We need to work together, Mr. Temporary Speaker. Uh, there is enough ingenuity in our community to deliver the leadership, communication and support needed by dedicated and innovative teachers and hardworking parents to help pupils access their right to education. To be fair to the Education Minister, he and his department have established ways in which this can be achieved. Clearer communication and engagement is possible via the Education Restart Programme the stakeholder group, the practitioners forum and the childcare reference group that I was glad to propose, with the addition of improved parental and pupil engagement and the cessation of announcements by the media and social media on Fridays at 5 p.m. Clear? Yeah, happy to give way. Thank the member for giving way. I just want to reiterate a point that is made. A lot of the frustration, with the member agreement, a lot of the frustration out there amongst principals and teachers is the lack of clear communication from the Department of Education and EA. Yes, I, I agree with the member, and as I say, I think the, the Minister has established avenues through which improved communication can take place if it is used in lieu of some of those other uh, times and avenues to do so. 
Clear guidance is needed on social distancing, uh, whether that is two metres, one metres or no social distancing, clarity is needed and indeed acknowledgement by the Minister that anything less than no social distancing may have an impact on the ability of a school to provide full-time access for parents and pupils. An education restart budget is clearly needed regardless of the social distancing in our schools in August. Parents and pupils are going to need additional support. Additional support for school accommodation, school cleaning, staffing, classroom assistance, ICT equipment, whether that's devices, printers and broadband access to deliver digital equality, training for teachers in online learning, the like of which I understand is being provided via Stranmillis and I believe C2K, guidance on blended learning and curriculum that is appropriate for the amount of time children will be in learning, focused on educational and social and emotional recovery. Temporary Speaker, leadership is also needed on post-primary transfer. It can't be fair or necessary to test children in November and December 2020. I actually think the Education Minister has some acceptance of that position. He says that those who do not think children should be tested in November and December for post-primary admissions have to come up with an alternative. His own department recommends alternative admissions criteria and statutorily requires boards of governors to have regards to them. They include criteria such as free school meals, applications from feeder and named primary schools, applications residing in a named parish, applications residing in a geographically defined area, applications for whom the school is the nearest suitable school and applications who have a sibling currently attending the school. They also recommend criteria which ought not to be used. I don't think time is going to allow me to go into those, but I think the Minister and I probably agree on some of those as well. Um, I ask the Minister what is unsuitable about that admissions criteria rec recommended by his own department for post-primary admissions. I would also seek clarification from the Education Minister as to whether his guidance is requiring primary schools to return P7 classes on a full-time basis in August, regardless of the impact of this on other year groups' access to school. Why Year 7 is prioritised and not Year 8, which is an actual transitional year to a new school. We, of course, also need leadership on special educational needs. And sorry, in relation to post-primary transfer as well, I would ask the Minister to reconsider his decision to decline my request to meet with parents in relation to post-primary transfer. We also need leadership on special educational needs, temporary speaker, and the dysfunction in special educational needs provision alone is reason enough to immediately lift the temporary suspension of work on the independent review of education. We need urgent delivery of the child care strategy and the emotional health and wellbeing framework. And in closing, temporary speaker, we need to work together with the education sector to overcome the risks and challenges of COVID-19 to deliver the quality, equal educational opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Little. The, the next speaker is Mr. Frew, but just before that, I'll just alert Mr. Sheehan that Mr. O'Dowd has stepped aside, so you have risen up the uh, speaking list considerably, so you'll be the next speaker after Mr. Frew. Mr. Frew. Thank you, Mr. Timmy. Speaker, uh, and I rise again uh, having looked at both the motion and the amendment. Uh, and yes, within those and the content with those, I see no issue with them. I think they're reasonable enough in what they request of the uh, Education Minister. Uh, and it's very important that we pay tribute, and we have the opportunity to pay tribute to all the principals and teachers and staff of school, not, not least all the other staff in the school from the non-teaching staff. Uh, who work hard and have worked hard over this last number of uh, months uh, beyond the call of duty on many occasions to provide the children with as much stable education material as possible. And then also to all the parents out there who have had to homeschool under really trying circumstances, pressurised circumstances at home where they're trying to work from home also. And they're trying to get quality time with their children too. And the whole thing has become a mishmash. And that's really detrimental to family life. And I, I must say my wife took up the burden of homework 
uh, duty in my house uh, when my children were younger. Uh, but that's the stress and strain even of homework is, is mighty enough, but to homeschool children too uh, must be a massive burden, especially... Yes, yes, I will. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve, for the member giving way. I would not want to know if the member would agree with me that maybe one of the things that could ease that burden would be to be able to bring in sort of pro some proper broadband across Northern Ireland and maybe some of the excess profits that BT have been using from the LPS contract could be used for providing all our pupils across Northern Ireland excellent broadband and facilities as well. So the, the member raises a very important point, and it's, it's crucial going forward for both children and business right across this province that they have adequate broadband. Absolutely right, and, and he's right to raise that. Uh, but principals know their school best, and they know their staff best. And principals and teachers also know their pupils best. And, and with regards to the responsibility of how they move forward safely in this day and age with regards to the, the risks that are involved, there'll be no better person in a school to measure risk than the principal of that built environment and of that school. And so I think we do teaching staff and principals a grave disservice when we say that they haven't got clear guidance, proper guidance. This minister has traipsed around this province, yeah. meeting school principals and teachers from right across this province in every area and art and part of Northern Ireland. And the minister must give credit for that. And the minister has listened where he can and has moved where he can. And I, I applaud the minister for that. And many of the principals and teaching staff that I speak to on a weekly basis have concurred with that and have echoed that sentiment and have been thankful for that. Now, again, we're living, we're living in very pressurised times. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And there are pressures and strains and uncertainties out there. And they will have to be ironed out, and, and, and that has to be brought in. But we've always worked off the maxim that one day, off, one day missing a school for a pupil is detrimental to their education. So it's important, very important, that we try and get as many pupils back to school on a full-time basis as soon as possible, in order that their educational opportunities are not uh, hurt. Because this is vital going forward. And the only way you can have equitable educational facilities and learning examples and, and experiences is to have pupils in school. There's no doubt about that. And that's what we should strive to do. But can I go to the wording of this motion here today? Because everything is in a context. And when we look at the day we've had, the motion reads, Mr. Speaker, that this assembly recognises the concern and anxiety that exists among teachers and non-teaching staff, as well as among pa parents and young people. Well, what, what of their anxiety today when they read the news and see the news and see Sinn Féin practising no social distancing, no responsibility with regards to what they've been preaching over the last number of months? What anxiety for teaching staff when they see that today? When they see this do as I say attitude, not do as I do, that has been so hurtful, so hurtful to the messaging and to the psyche of our people when they see the work that they have put in over the last three to four months, trying to keep people safe, and now they see people flaunting that regulation okay, and disregard for the safety measures. Close, it is unbelievable that that has taken place today, and it's a shame on the party opposite that they have allowed this to happen. There have been many occasions in the past number of weeks. Would the member bring months. his remarks to close? Oh, well, I'll leave it there. Thank you. This debate has attracted a lot of attention. Unfortunately, I have to report that we will only have time for three more speakers. They will be Mr. Shane, Mr. Justin McNulty, and Mr. Steve Aiken. I realise that's considerable disappointment to Mrs. Armstrong and to Ms. Hunter and to Mr. Carroll. Unfortunately, uh, they're just, everyone used their time to the maximum and there were numerous interventions. So I now call Mr. Sheehan, Mr. Pat Sheehan. Gormai, I've got a last Kian Korla Shaladak, I've got a Lorem and Shaw and Akhtamar Ahar, the Virch Gershak, a Vesa Golis Jack, a Rang a Hain, I've got Rang a Kuig, Emlena. August Bawailam of Wake as a goal, the legend pre Voyager, the Moonshuri, August and Foran Umlan, a Munskull, and Cleva Give. I speak here tonight, uh, Mr. Uh, temporary Speaker. 
As the father of two young daughters who will be going into primary one and primary five respectively uh, this year coming. Uh, and I want to put on record my thanks to the principal, the teachers and all the staff in Bunskull and Clevergive, uh, and Neeskull and Clevergive uh, as well, for their dedication and diligence in helping us as parents over the last number of months. Um, and Bun School and Cleva Give is an Irish medium primary school. Agus a cion corla is kentia gamay fibana a garnial nagil scoliac der a hoskal stov a me van an oar. A div slantia agus sawal chakja agus an scaru socialta. It's certain that the Irish medium sector will have uh, problems with the reopening in September. Uh, in terms of health and safety, as well as social distancing. And uh, as it now stands, and the Minister will be aware of this, 60% of the accommodation in the Irish medium sector is housed in prefab or modular accommodation or in buildings that were not designed as schools. And this lack of purpose-built facilities will have a detrimental impact on schools facilitating their students in particular those Irish medium schools that are located outside of urban areas and where alternative uh, space might not come easily in the surrounding area. Irish medium schools are already at full capacity. The Irish medium sector is the fastest growing sector and we want this trend to continue, not to regress. But if you take even College of First Year in West Belfast, which is the largest Irish medium post-primary school on the island of Ireland, uh, when a significant new development was opened in that school just a few years ago, uh, it had a capacity of 550. The enrolment is now something around 680. How are they going to uh, practice social distancing uh, in the classrooms? And there are concerns here around the lack of available school space having an effect on parents choosing an Irish medium school for their child. The Education Authority and the Department of Education are basing their social distancing guidelines on a classroom of 60 square metres. As I have mentioned, this does not accurately reflect the reality in Irish medium education, where some classrooms are as small as 37 square metres. Additional classroom space will be required, and the department has an obligation to work with the bodies representing the sector to facilitate this. But while I'm catching this year and ask for Munchuri Kailaha V on Riv and Fandem, I was aware of on Favi Fananor and Lena. And I want to talk now about the lack of qualified teachers uh, who were in the Irish medium sector before the pandemic. And of course, that shortage will be exacerbated when schools reopen in September. The Irish medium sector is likely to be more acutely affected by teacher shortages, as a lack of teachers already existed before the current crisis. This will be made worse as schools return, with the risk of a severe shortage of qualified Irish medium teachers to fill current vacancies and Irish medium substitute teachers to cover for teachers who are shielding. If the department is to be acting decisively on the development of the Irish medium sector, they need to begin to address this shortage in teachers. We need to begin to engage with teacher training colleges as a matter of urgency to deal with this ever-growing issue. While I'm here, I'm here to ask you 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 to One of the areas I want to draw attention to is the lack of educational resources in the Irish medium sector. It suffers from a, bespoke, from a lack of bespoke resources for teaching, and this will have been compounded by the remote learning undertaken by teachers during the lockdown period. Can Irish medium principals have consistently his, uh, requested online resources, apps for appropriate learning, learning distance, uh, and this needs to be considered by the Minister in the time ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, Mr Aiken has generously removed his name from the list 
And of course, Mr McNulty is entitled to speak uh, in the summation of the amendment. So I'm glad to say that we will get at least another two speakers in. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Mrs Armstrong, Ms Hunter, and potentially, if things go well, Mr Jerry Carroll. Uh, Mrs Armstrong. <laughs> Mrs Armstrong. Thank you so much, temporary speaker. I wasn't expecting that. I will keep it brief because I would like Mr. Carroll to have his opportunity. I will declare an interest from the very start. I am a mum of a 17-year-old who's due to go into her A-level year, so my heart's broke with her. And I'm also a governor of a primary school and a post-primary school. What I would like to say about this motion is, of course, we're going to support the motion and the amendment. Why not? But can I just please ask, as my colleague has said, that we start building a bit of teamwork. We are talking about our young people across um, the whole of Northern Ireland. They don't need to hear politicians ripping lumps out of each other. What they do need to hear is that their school is going to be a positive experience. We're going to come out of the coronavirus and they'll be able to get back with their friends again in a safe way. And I have to say to all those parents out there, Mr. Frew has brought it up already. There's a reason why I didn't become a teacher and homeschooling has proved that completely. My hat is off to all of those parents. Um, for those who are at home all day with their kids, trying to do work as well as doing the homeschooling, and for those parents who have had to go out to work and have been worried sick about how their children are getting on while they're with whoever they have been with, perhaps a school when they're sitting there with two or three other people from much different age groups. One size is not going to fit all. One size is not going to fit all. We will have... Children with learning disabilities, their parents, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting a lot of calls from parents saying, how is the at-shoulder support supposed to happen with social distancing? Can we give them a solution? We cannot lock toilets in post-primary schools. Girls have periods. Let's not shy away from it. We cannot exclude our young people from being having access to space. Um, we need to see the teamwork for ourselves and also for our teachers with our pupils and with our parents. We need to recognise the, needs of our, the physical needs of our young people but also the emotional needs and this is going to be one of the toughest things for our um, classroom assistants and our, our teachers to deal with alongside parents. Young people will need time to talk. There are young people who have not had a good experience through lockdown. We know that the increase in domestic violence across Northern Ireland sadly means that there are a number of young people coming out of those homes. There are young people who have seen family conflict, let's face it, we're fighting with each other in the assembly because we're stressed out and it's a non-stop, our whole day is morning, noon and night work, you'd never get to leave it when you're at home. Some have had loss and bereavement, those children need time to speak, they need time to talk to each other and that's very hard to do when half of their classmates are at home working for part of the week and the other half are in school and then they swap over and they never see their other classmates. The transitions, those pupils that move from P7 into um, year eight or first year in old money, um, I, I, my heart's broke for them. And those upper sixth or fifth years that have left school and it's been like a nothing, you know, it, it didn't really get to the end for them. We have to be aware that there will be difficulties because of this horrendous pandemic. We could see a rise in racism in schools with bullying because it has already been seen across the water that there are people who are from with Asian backgrounds have been picked on and bullied saying that they're the cause of this virus because they may be Chinese. There's a lot going on here and I think what we need to do is to just say, do you know what? Our message out of this place needs to be more positive. We need to say this is a message that young people are listening to because they want to hear about their schools. This is something we're talking about that interests them. And all I would say on this one is we have a great motion here. We have a good minister who does care. We do have a committee that cares as well and are meeting with people so often. I don't know how Chris Little does it. My head would be turned. But we have a good team here and I think we should be talking more positively for our young people. Um, as a mummy, I have a 17-year-old who does my head on a regular basis. She's looking to get out and torture me fellas, but she's not getting that. And <laughs> she wants to get back to school, but she's scared. <laughs> she's scared. And if the 17-year-old is scared, what's the 7-year-old like? We have a job to do, folks, and I really hope that we can get it done and we can get these young people back to school as quickly as possible. But let's work together for this. Thank you. Many members were shocked when, the, when Mrs Armstrong re revealed that she had a, a child of 17. Quite remarkable. Uh, well, I call upon uh, Miss Hunter, Miss Hunter, and we may get Mr Carlin. Miss Hunter. 
Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker, uh, and I echo uh, Ms. Armstrong's comments and sentiment about working together, and I think it will be highly beneficial for us all. Um, yes, we, the SDLP, recognise uh, the sheer level and pre of pressure and uncertainty that has arose uh, for teachers and pupils right across the North as a result of COVID-19. Our concern here today uh, pertains to ensuring the physical health of pupils in these coming months with the slow uh, reopening and reintroduction uh, of classes. My concerns today derive from school sizes. Uh, while some schools, often new build schools, have the capacity to home more pupils due to being more spacious, uh, smaller schools, often rural, uh, may have to compensate by more pupils staying off. This could further impact their education. Uh, uh, so today, I hope the Minister can provide more clear uh, guidance uh, on this. We are happy to learn that the Department has received new IT devices for distribution uh, to children who are experiencing uh, accessing digital learning. Uh, over the past few weeks, myself and other MLAs have been contacted by families who are struggling uh, to attain the same amount of access to broadband, uh, as mentioned earlier, and to other technological tools uh, needed for remote learning. This announcement is much welcome, uh, as we fear some students, especially those from low-income families, have been left in the dark, and no child should suffer academically as a result of this. In light of these difficulties, we welcome the news that an increasing number of selective schools have announced they will not be using academic selection for the year 2021 and 2022. I think this shows great compassion and consideration of young people's mental health. At times when students have been faced with so many difficulties over the past few months, academic achievement bears so much weight to young people. And speaking to young people, I think it is evident that academic achievement plays a huge factor from which they derive their sense of self-worth. Sadly, some schools have decided to continue with academic selection, despite the undeniable, unfair education deficits that have occurred as a result of this pandemic. I have spoken with a young family in my constituency, a single mother who is a frontline worker. She's a carer. Her child gets less homeschooling than other children uh, due to the fact, as a mother, she had to continue to go to work over the past few months. Is it fair that her daughter should be held accountable for an academic decline, though it is not through her own fault? I feel strongly and agree with other parties here today that no child should be left behind. I hope the Minister today can provide us with more clarity on health and safety within the schools. A catch-up programme is necessary. We want no child to be left behind. And I support the motion and the amendment before us today. Thank you. Um, Mr Carroll, you have four minutes. Thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker, and thank you, Mr Reagan. Feel free to step aside in any debate that I'm not going to be called. <laughs> I will help. I will help. I will, I will happily speak on most things, and I'm sure people here and uh, the public are delighted to hear me on every issue, so thank you very much. Uh, and, and all, and all, and all seriousness, Mr Temporary Speaker, um, uh, the fears outlined in this motion uh, and the amendment uh, are true for teachers, for parents, and, and indeed for pupils, and I'm more than happy to uh, support uh, this motion and the amendment. Uh, I thank the members for bringing it. Uh, I've been contacted, like others, by parents uh, and teachers um, uh, and we continue to stand with them, ensuring their safety uh, and the safety of pupils of all ages uh, is maintained and uh, protected. All along throughout this pandemic, Mr. Uh, Temporary Speaker, uh, we have consistently called for the executive to make decisions about reopening uh, and lifting elements of the lockdown uh, on the basis of scientific uh, medical advice, uh, consistent with uh, the likes of the World Health Organization and other bodies, as this motion um, urges. But as members in the chamber will know, that, that hasn't always been the case, uh, and per particularly in relation to care homes. Uh, we know the devastation uh, caused uh, and the failure to protect the vulnerable. Uh, and uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker, uh, as a member on the Health Committee, uh, two weeks in a row now, um, I've asked uh, for the scientific advice pertaining to um, the uh, implementation of amendments to the coronavirus regulations, and I'm still waiting on it. So I think it is very frustrating uh, uh, that we aren't getting uh, that information and we should um, very quickly. Um, I do have to say, though, um, while supporting the motion, um, I, I would say 
Um, the fears that you know, the, the members have outlined proposing the motion about schools reopening uh, are the exact same fears that hospitality workers and other sectors uh, will soon face by the end of this week, uh, but be forced into work essentially or lose their jobs, as the case may be. Um, and there's nothing really mentioned or done about that. And obviously, the regulations passed today will we'll make that uh, the case. We'll cement that uh, in legislation in stone. Uh, so I think it has to be an, a, a serious level of consistency uh, in, in approach to this crisis. And the junior minister earlier referred to there being no uh, linear approach. Um, uh, I think he's right, and I think he's being kind. I think the, the approach that the executive has taken throughout this crisis has been. Um, very, uh, very worrying and, and disastrous in cases. Um, workers and trade unions um, who represent workers in bars, clubs, restaurants, uh, who have been uh, loud and clear uh, about their inability to socially distance in the workplace will no doubt wonder, just as I do, um, why there is no motion um, to call for protections for them in their workplace based on scientific and medical advice as well uh, as tonight's motion. Uh, and I think staff and care homes would, would be um, raising similar uh, issues uh, as well. So while I do support the motion and the amendment um, and whatever opportunity I can to support teachers, parents and pupils, uh, I think other workers uh, have been left without uh, adequate uh, protection uh, and that needs to be addressed uh, as well. Um, Robbie Butler said that uh, teachers are used uh, and abused um, and I think that's very much been the case. Um, disgracefully, we've seen MPs uh, attack teachers and their unions and uh, I think some of them are still waiting on an apology for Mr Wilson. I think he should do the right thing and, and apologise for his comments uh, towards them. I think we'll have to pay tribute to our teachers and uh, teaching staff for working throughout this pandemic, uh, for working to uh, educate our young people throughout the year, uh, and also for taking action to close schools when the minister wouldn't act, when the minister dithered. You know, it was teachers. Could, could the member bring his and comments and to a so close, please? I'll leave my, my comments there and happy to support the motion and the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Carroll. Uh, I now call upon the Minister of Education, Mr Peter Weir, to respond to the motion. And Mr Weir, you've got 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker, sir. And I, I know you've been waiting to hear that, that terminology for quite a period of, of time, so I congratulate you on, you on your post. Can I also join with, with others as well? I think the mover of this motion mentioned the, the sad death of, of Noah Donoghue. Um, and can I say that uh, along, I pass on my sympathy to his family and to St Malachy's his school. And can I say, well, I think that we have been, to the best of my knowledge, fortunate enough as part of the COVID pandemic that no school-aged child in Northern Ireland, as far as I know, has died from, uh, from the virus. During the period of that, when it's perhaps sometimes gone unnoticed, we have had a number of pupils throughout Northern Ireland who have sadly passed away for a variety of reasons. And I join, I suppose, in adding equally my sympathy to their families and their schools uh, as well. Can I thank all members who have spoken in this debate, and I welcome um, the opportunity to speak on these issues. Um, I'm sure not everything I say that everyone will agree with, not everything that's said in this debate I would necessarily agree with. But I suppose today's motion uh, in relation to the anxiety that, that exists um, may I say at the outset uh, that I don't see any particular problem with either the motion or the amendment. As is often the case in this House, obviously, whenever motions are submitted, uh, there are probably a number of elements of this that have either been overtaken by events that have already been done or are in the process of doing, but that's no reason to divide the House uh, on those. I'm fully aware from speaking to principals, school staff, pupils, that there are genuine concerns and anxiety in relation to the reopening of schools. And I've noted previously that the issues we're facing across society, in particular in education, are unprecedented. Young people have outlined their concerns in a range of surveys, including the 1,000 children who continue, uh, contributed to the Youth Forum survey, and indeed many young people who continue to respond to the Education Authority's weekly survey facilitated by Youth Service. What I would say is, and while there is not a consensus on, uh, for everyone in terms, of, uh, in terms of this, the biggest concern that is out there, and it is one that is shared by parents, by teachers, uh, by trade unionists, uh, by pupils themselves, is a desire, is the concern over the lost learning and the lost opportunities. And they desire to get back to school. And I think that there is a consensus of that. And I would again reiterate what I mentioned earlier on in question time, uh, that I believe that we are on a good trajectory at present. And if things move 
the way they are moving, I hope to be in a position that the executive will agree before we see the, the start of term, to be able to move to that position where we can ensure that we have five days a week for every pupil in Northern Ireland. That, that is surely something that we would all share. I'm conscious of the, um, of the, the very practical challenges. And there, in a short space of, space of time, there's an incredible amount of work that's been done uh, to develop responses to this. I would like to put, on, uh, put again on record my appreciation to the incredible work that's been done by school teachers, by leaders, by classroom assistants, indeed all those who have been working with such dedication in the wider education sector throughout this challenging period. The new school day guidance, which was published by the executive on the 19th of June, sets out a framework under which schools can now plan to reopen schools. The guidance was co-designed under the auspices of a practitioners group, facilitated by my department by 20 school principals. They were representative of every sector within education, every age range within education. So it included uh, control, maintain, voluntary grammar, Irish medium, integrated. It included special schools. It involved nurseries, primaries, and post-primaries. Um, so it, it had that very broad range. And while I suppose the, the broad principles will be similar across other settings, it's recognised that there is additional work um, in terms of youth, early years, and indeed we've been able to issue last week particular guidance in terms of special schools. So I pay tribute to the work of the principals. They operated at an intensity that was beyond their day job and provided invaluable uh, professional and operational insights. Also drafts of the guidance were shared with trade unions, sectoral body representatives and the chief medical officer, Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, and all feedback consistent with the remit of the practitioner group is there in the drafts of the, the guidance. Now, mention has been made about the level of time frame and the notice that we've been able to give um, schools in terms of the preparation work. Uh, and here there is a balance. If we were to take account of um, particularly the views and have that co-design process, that will mean that naturally things do not move as quickly as they, uh, as they can in other bits. But we are actually ahead of the game compared to other jurisdictions. Mentions have been made that as yet there is no clear picture of what is happening in the Republic of Ireland, where I know one of the parties here sits as the main opposition uh, within, the, uh, within that jurisdiction. In England, prior to the 1st of June, there was relatively little notice given, and indeed we still await for September the guidance in England as to what they intend to do. Scotland, which is starting uh, at an earlier stage than us, has also issued guidance there in a fairly similar time frame. But also Wales, which um, where schools resumed on the 29th of June, issued guidance on the 11th of June, 18 days beforehand. Whatever criticisms that can be made in terms of timescale, we are looking at that on the basis of a couple of months ahead of that. Also has been made, mention has been made that certainly the department will try um, as much as possible to provide uh, that level of financial support where there are additional necessary uh, resources that are required for schools to help in that, that reopening. Uh, and we will work together with the sector on that. Mention has been made, I think, of childcare. There is now an executive childcare recovery scheme. I think it will learn from um, some of the weaknesses within the, the current system, but it's critical that childcare is aligned with school reopening. And indeed, reaching a point at which schools are able to be fully open um, is one of the, the biggest single actions which can be taken to ease the pressures on childcare. Mention has been made about the, uh, about the year groups. The position of years 7, years 12 and 14 are consistent with what has happened in other jurisdictions as transition years. And for example, in England, whenever, uh, apart from the very youngest within primary schools, their P6, which is the equivalent of our year 7, was one of the areas prioritised, as was uh, those entering the final year of GCSE and A-levels. The principles that we worked with uh, emphasised that guidelines, guidance needed to have broad parameters, but also would have a level of flexibility. Uh, and indeed, there's a range. The aim was to get out that, that guidance as, as quickly as possible with executive approval. Um, there are a range of other issues that uh, will need to be considered. And indeed, are being considered. Well, I'm, I'm trying, with respect, I'm trying to get through quite a few items in, in relation to that. I mean, I know there will probably be other issues which will be able to be picked up tomorrow in the, uh, in the Education Committee. So, uh, you know, I'm aware that some feel that the guidance doesn't go far enough. Uh, I suppose it's striking the balance between producing a, I think a 52 or 54 page document, um, when I know obviously there's been suggestions that perhaps it can all be put in 140 characters. I, I, I suspect that if the department issued 140 characters as a, as a response, there would be a reasonable level of complaints um, from that. Um, 
Can I indicate as well, mention has been made, I suppose, particularly of the issue of transport. Again, this is an issue which the executive is looking at in a collective manner. Uh, and can I say it is critical, and I think probably grasping the nettle of finding routes in terms of transport, which means that actually strict social distancing is not particularly compatible with, with full school transport. I know the previous position of the Department of Infrastructure, but hope to move on, was talking about a 15% cap on those who could travel on, uh, on buses. That's something which I don't think would work or be acceptable uh, within that. Can I say in terms of the one metre uh, distancing side of things, we did, this obviously predated any decision as regards the wider executive position on one metre. There, there is no distance ultimately that is safe. It is about providing mitigation measures. And indeed, if you speak to medical efforts, uh, experts, they will not say one metre is safe or two metres is safe. It is about providing that level of protection. But we worked in terms of the detail that the uh, draft guidance was shared with the chief medical officer, the chief scientific officer. We worked alongside the Department of Health and the PHA on the detail of the guidance. So that this has been, as indicated by the motion, it, uh, you know, I would maybe slightly quibble with the references to WHO or others. We've worked, I suppose, with the bespoke teams in Northern Ireland, uh, but it has got that level of, of uh, support, and it is that level of ad adherence uh, to that. Uh, it is, obviously, as, as indicated, the issue on the curriculum. Uh, there is detailed guidance which has been published on curriculum planning for 2021. CCA are continuing to work on the issues to how we uh, deal with examinations. But it's clear the case, and this is not just something that's a Northern Ireland issue, but there is an impact on the curriculum in terms of uh, where we are, uh, and that is inevitably going to be. So it is about concentrating on a level of basics. Again, I suppose one of the state restrictions on the curriculum, particularly for those uh, later years where there are public examinations, which put pupils in Northern Ireland sometimes taking examinations from outside Northern Ireland. This, we've got to ensure, working with colleagues, uh, that we have a level playing field across a range of jurisdictions. We've got to make sure that Northern Ireland pupils are not disadvantaged. Mention, I think, was made about uh, doing things in conjunction with uh, different ministers. I'm in regular contact with the um, education ministers in England, Scotland and Wales. I've spoken directly and had conversations with the outgoing, uh, now outgoing and has, has uh, departed um, Minister in the Republic of Ireland and uh, seeking an, an early discussion uh, with the new Minister in the, the Republic of Ireland on education. So there, there will be an opportunity, I think, to learn from that experience. We are fortunate that the Northern Ireland curriculum, I suppose, is specifically designed to be adaptable and dynamic, and that therefore it can create the ideal scaffold to support and underpin uh, teaching and uh, learning. I think the limited prescription that we have does give schools flexibility to choose what to teach um, and for how long and how often, and use approaches that best suit their pupils. Turning, I suppose, particularly to the amendment, uh, in April, my department conducted a survey with school principals to look at strategic approaches to distance learning and access to online learning. And the survey, survey highlighted that all schools were either using online or hard copy approaches. I, I take on board the point that's been made in terms of broadband. Uh, obviously, that is something which lies outside the remit of my department, and indeed the uh, the proposals that are being put forward by the Department for the Economy in terms of rolling out broadband um, are something that will be of, of long-term help, but will not be there in every, in every case. School principals who reported that pupils may be experienced barriers to online reported the main reason was a lack of access to a device, often followed by that lack of access to broadband. Consequently, uh, we've adopted a three-stage process. First of all, looking at what um, devices were already within existing stock, then uh, there, was, there had been previously about 3,500 devices which were being, um, that were being sought by uh, EA and being procured. We are now at that second stage, and during the last week, a number of those have been rolled out to try and um, access that. And the department is also in the position where it is also going to be a central procurement to try and fill the gap as well. But mention, I think, has very clearly been made that, and we will not know definitively uh, where we are until we see in September. But we can all make an assessment that there has been, no matter how brilliant the teaching has been done, no matter how good remote learning in a lot of cases has been done, I think as somebody mentioned in the debate, it is no substitute for that face-to-face -face classroom teaching, which is why I'm so keen to see that resume in full. But it has also been the case that, that we've been giving some thought for some time in terms of how we do that level of catch-up. And as such, again, proposals, while they may well have been um, overwhelmed by the the focus that was there in terms of the reopening of schools, 
as part of summer schemes and indeed summer, re summer and beyond recapture of learning. There was also proposals put to the executive. And I'm glad to say, and I'll outline just briefly the strands within that, that today in the June monitoring round, there has been agreement by the executive uh, and funding has been made available for that. That is for the remainder of this financial year. There may well be other costs that will, that will run into the following year. But that is three strands. There are two smaller interventions during the summer that were. Schools are looking voluntarily to provide some level of additional summer learning. The department will provide financial support. But teachers do deserve a break, and consequently, it is only where schools have uh, volunteered to do that and want to do that. But we feel that they shouldn't be doing that to their own detriment, and therefore there's a degree of support. We're looking at a support over the summer of a virtual classroom, which again, people can tap into. Again, rel both of these, on the grand scheme of things, relatively low cost. But looking as we roll out into next year, an engaged programme, which will ensure that particularly those from a socially deprived background will be provided with that additional level of support, additional interventions in terms of uh, learning. So, from that point of view, I think I'm at one with the uh, amendment, if not always necessarily in the, the words that are used in the, the speech. And I look forward to uh, Mr McNulty's uh, summing up, but at least in terms of the spirit of, of what is there. Look, uh, the issue has also been raised of mental health. That is clearly, and while a lot of young people are very resilient, uh, and perhaps more resilient at times than, than some of us adults in that, in that regard, there is a need for support for mental health, and as part of the budget, uh, and if there's additional help that can be given to the Department of Health, it would be very welcome. But as part of the budget, we'd already, there's already been an allocation of additional five million into the budget this year for mental health. You know, as with all ministers, if the budget was considerably bigger, I'd be happy to make that, uh, that make stronger. So uh, I appreciate there's probably a number of issues I've not been able to touch on in, in 15 minutes. I'm sure in one of our lively exchanges at the Education Committee tomorrow, they will be, um, uh, they will be revived in that regard. But look, I think from what well, I think this House, we may have uh, some salvos fired across different parts of the, the benches. I, I would take on board, though, I think there is a broad consensus of what is being done, what needs to be done, and the outcome that all of us seek, which is ensuring that our children get back to that full level of learning, which is shared not just by all MLAs across all parties, but by teachers, by parents, and by pupils. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now call Mr Justin McNulty to wind on the amendment. Mr McNulty. Um, it's a pleasure to wind on this important debate. Um, <clears throat> I will begin, however, by offering my condolences to Noah Donoghue's mum, Fiona, his family, his friends, his classmates at St Malagy's College, and to the volunteers, the police and the rescue organisations who all put in such a heroic effort in trying to locate him. I also want to pay a tribute to our school teachers, principals, teacher, classroom, classroom assistants, school staff, pupils and parents. The roles and environments have been completely reconfigured and it's sad that many teachers feel that they have been used and abused during this pandemic. Given the hour, I'm not going to rehash very bad on what each member has said or has, contributed, or has contributed to this debate, um, you all know what you've said, and it's unanswered anyway. Um, we are in agreement on a number of matters across this chamber. Um, concerns about addressing IT, broadband and online inequality, acting to address children's educations who come from deprived areas or from families with uh, lower incomes, Concerns in relation to social distancing uh, capabilities and capacity within schools, staggered start concerns, uh, an accelerated catch-up programme for all kids, um, social bubbles, blended learning provision that is fair and equitable, school maintenance accelerated, appreciation for the work of the trade unions, um, school transport concerns to be addressed, uh, restart incorporating physical activity. We've all heard a lot of talk about metal, uh, metal um, health issues, but not enough about uh, physical activity. Also, start, uh, start numbers um, and possible shortages. Or sorry, staff numbers and possible shortages in specific areas to be addressed. Ability for schools to meet the needs of those students with SEN. Um, no child to suffer academically as, as a consequence of this pandemic. That's a major challenge for the education system. Um, a reopening um, procedure that has the capacity to address any mental health issues 
zero tolerance to bullying and childcare, which must be aligned with school reopening. And there was a bit of disagreement on academic selection and the example of some political leaders uh, today. Um, but I think it's important to reiterate what the Minister said. And it's a cause for celebration that no school aged child has passed away as a consequence of COVID-19. That is cause for celebration. Um, principals, teachers, pupils, staff, parents are seeking clear, unambigu unambiguous, realistic guidance on a safe return to education in the classroom. And said by the Minister, teachers want to teach. I have not met one teacher over the last two months, over the last two or three months, who was in holiday mo mode. They were very, very caught up in trying to adjust and address the challenges they face with teaching kids remotely. Some in the classroom, some remotely. And parents have had to change their routines enormously so too, and have adapted to becoming even more hands-on in relation to the education of their kids, and all in while juggling their day jobs. They should be major tribute paid to them. Most of all, I'm thinking about the girls and boys who are of school age who are dying to get back to see their friends and teachers, and who are dying to get back to school. And it's a unique situation where kids are crying for school. Um, I think at the end of August, start of September, I think we all want to see a safe, fair, positive, challenging, and encouraging learning environment for every pupil and every teacher and every staff member to return. I support the motion as amended. Thank you, Mr. McNulty. And I now call upon Catherine uh, Kelly to conclude and wind up the debate. Uh, Catherine, you have got 10 minutes. This motion was tabled before the Minister's statement last, last week and since guidance was provided. But we feel that tonight's debate is important and has been use useful to ensure that concerns that still remain are highlighted. The past three months has had a significant impact on our children and young people, on parents, on childcare practitioners and on our school leaders, many of which we have heard here this evening and I'll touch on later on. Never before has our education system faced so many challenges. Many of our preschool children are to begin formal education in eight weeks' time. Their parents are right now busy buying uniforms and preparing for their children's first day. But what will that actually look like? Some settings and classes are not big enough to hold all of the children attending in September. Some settings and classes may be big enough, but they do not have sufficient staff numbers to allow for more than one protective bubble. Recent guidance issued by the department in respect of preschools mentions a blended learning approach similar to that of schools. But how can this apply to preschoolers when their education is based mainly on play? How do preschool leaders ensure learning is being achieved at home through play? Department of Education guidance does not take this into account. It does not suffice to attach the preschool restart with school restart. This is a worrying time for preschool leaders. Will the department issue their PEGS funding earlier so they can prepare their settings and, if needs be, recruit and vet staff? Will the community and voluntary preschool settings receive support through any new scheme that comes forward from the Department of Education or Health? Both departments need to be considering these questions. Settings need support to sustain themselves so they can open their doors with confidence in September, so they can reassure parents dropping their ch children off on their first day, and so they can hold on to their skilled staff who we rely on so much to educate our children. Another cohort of parents who received guidance in the return to school was parents of children who attend special schools. Many parents and school leaders had been waiting on the guidance in the hope that it would include a plan and details for a safe return. But that has not been the case. Schools have been left in the large having to read between the lines and incorporate their own plans for September. Friday's guidance has not reassured parents. If anything, they have even more questions. How do special schools that are already at maximum capacity welcome all children back and also ensure they are socially distancing? If remote learning will again come into play, the department needs to ensure all children are indeed being taught remotely. Many parents in the last three months have raised issues around the lack of remote learning and also the absence of any connection digitally with teachers, classroom assistants or friends. 
And some of us will remember a young person a number of weeks ago explaining their feelings during lockdown as sad, isolated and lonely. There cannot be a return to this kind of remote learning. The guidance also mentions a reduction of health therapies and or support provided. This is very, very concerning. To many children and young people, these therapies are a lifeline. I would urge both the Department of Health and Education to ensure that every effort is made to remove any barriers to them being able to avail of this. Tomorrow is the 1st of July, and as of yet, parents have, had, have not had sight of what summer provision will look like for their children. There is a huge frustration amongst children, young people and their parents. The most vulnerable in our society need to know when summer provision will begin, what, what it will look like and who exactly will be delivering it. Since March, many parents and their sons and daughters have had little to no interaction with the outside world, no school and no respite. Summer provision is crucial in supporting families after such a long period of time with little to no support. The mental health and well-being of children and their parents is paramount. They're crying out for some sort of provision urgently to re-engage their children. This must begin as soon as possible and without delay. We are all more than aware right now that our childcare sector is on its knees. And my party colleague mentioned in her opening that childcare will be a defining issue, and she is right. We have seen many welcome interventions in recent weeks where the key worker definition no longer applies to childcare. Capacity has ceased within settings, albeit a play pod has been introduced, and indemnity will now cover all children until the end of August. These are very welcome easements, and especially today's announcement from the Finance Minister that £10.5 million in financial support will be allocated to the sector to enable sustainability. Yeah. Thank the member for giving way and, and recognise the consistency with which she's raised childcare provision on the Education Committee. Uh, would you agree with me that it's absolutely vital that details of how to apply for that additional funding for childcare are made clear as quickly as possible to the childcare sector? Thank you for your, your comment, um, and I agree wholeheartedly. Um, we need uh, guidance and detail as soon as possible, urgently. Um, we, have, we have no detail yet on how this will be administered, um, but one thing is for sure, it cannot be a repeat of the previous scheme. A complex and bureaucratic application process, with many still waiting for support after the scheme was first announced over eight weeks ago. This new allocation needs to be readily available and with no barriers in place. Families need childcare now more than ever. And that's why our health and social care trusts need to be working as quickly as they can to ensure settings and childminders can reopen their doors safely and, return, and parents can return to work, content that their child is in the best possible care. COVID-19 has shone a spotlight on how crucial to society our childcare sector is. Without it, it's likely many women would not be working Children would be without vital early education and care. And, and until we have more information on, on how today's announcement will be allocated, what the process will be for applying for funds, and when applications will open, this vital economic sector is at risk of collapse. Not only would this have significant implications at this time of crisis, but in the weeks and months ahead when we are trying to rebuild our economy. Last Ken Corlea, there have been many comments made tonight. Mr. McCrossan mentioned the hard work of our school leaders over the past three months. Mr. Butler mentioned transport and the huge issue that it is. How can we ensure the safety of children and young people when travelling to and from school? Mr. Little talked about the need for a restart budget. Many costs associated with restart when school budgets are already at capacity. Mr. Frew mentioned parents and how the past three months of homeschooling has been incredibly stressful. These are only some of the hugely important issues highlighted this evening, and I thank members for your contribution. It is imperative that Minister Weir takes all of the points made, made tonight into consideration. I urge members to support our motion and also the amendment. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Mr Daniel McCrossan and Mr Justin McNulty be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary of any, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question is that the motion as amended be agreed.
All those in favour, say aye. aye. All those against, no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next uh, order, the next uh, item on the order paper, is the adjournment.